to the Beach Attacks Home Supply Company Thursday afternoon live. And this is our wintry, cold, cold, cold day. Uh, the trees are not doing the work today, and they have slipped below. And uh, it's been blowing snow all day long. It's breezy out. And uh, as we mentioned last last week, all you people who are living in warmer climates, you really need to come here and experience it sometime um, in the first 50 to even possibly weekend, maybe uh, 30, 40 below wind chill. And that's something to experience if you've never done that before. Uh, it's nice to be here in Iowa this time of year. And the best part of this is really most of you appreciate springtime. If it ever comes, if springtime ever comes. Um, if you uh, remember last week, uh, we we started at the last few weeks, we started with a, a deer hide. We started with measuring, I think, and we showed you how to cape, and we showed you um, uh, little tricks that, that we think are helpful. And we uh, took one of our, our customer capes, caped it out. Uh, we flushed it on the machine. I think we showed you the uh, American Eagle flushing machine, and that's a great, great, great instrument. If you've uh, never used a flushing machine, um, we talked about a lot of people call us and they say, I want to tan my own deer hides, or they are tanning their own deer hides. The most amazing call I get all the time is people will call me and they say they, are, they do several elk a year and they're having trouble with their process. And in talking to them, I'll say, how are you flushing the hides? And they'll mention that they're doing it with a knife. Um, I, I can't imagine um, what kind of a flusher you'd have to be to flush an elk with a tool like this and be able to tan it. But there's a lot of people out there doing it. Um, if you've never had a flushing machine, at least try one sometime. Um, if you go to the shows, there'll be people demonstrating um, the rotary wheel flushing machine and it'll make short work of your um, thinning your hides. And people that call up and say they don't use a flushing machine, I always tell them you need to reduce the thickness of your leather by a minimum of two thirds. We want that deer cape. Um, this is the one we've been working on. You want it thinned down to almost to the hair roots. You don't want to hit the hair roots. I can see I have a couple areas here that are thin, but we still haven't got to the hair roots. And uh, the thinner you get your hide, the more supple it's going to be when you mount your deer and the more detail you're going to be able to put into your finished product. And if you mount a deer that hasn't been thinned compared to a deer that's been properly thinned, um, you're not going to believe the difference. It's going to be such an amazing difference that um, you'll wonder how some of these taxidermists do such beautiful, beautiful work and it's with properly thinned hides. You can't do it without a properly thinned hide and that takes um, a flesh and machine or a magic knife and I've never found a magic knife in all the years of doing this. <clears throat> um, so anyway, our process um, once, and, and you saw us do it, you can review the, the live feed from the, that we have on YouTube, and our process is to cape the deer out, we turn the ears inside out to start, we split the lips, we take the cartilage out of the nose, we thin the, the big membrane around the eye, and we remove all fat and flesh from the skin that we can get. Now you don't need a fleshing machine for that. You can use a fleshing beam, and we showed you how to take the, the yellow sharp fleshing beam. Um, there's, there's a whole variety of, of fleshing tools that you can use. And, uh, but you do want to get all the fat and meat off of this cape. At that point, it's ready to mark so you know who's it is, whether it's going to a commercial tannery or you're going to tan it yourself, you always want to keep track of whose hide this is. So we'll always put a series of punch marks down in the corner of our deer, um, and there will be a hundreds row, I think we drew it on the board, a tens row and a ones row, and we put a little small punches, nothing that has to be repaired. But if the tags ever come off, which they do, see if you people who have sent things to the tannery, you know that you get them back, the tags are gone. So that can put you in a pickle, literally. Um, you'll have to search for your punch marks. And if you remember to punch your hides to identify them, um, one customer from another, 
you can easily identify that hide. And uh, we always even do it two times. We'll do it once in the lower left-hand corner, and then we'll move over a few inches and do it again. That way, if the tannery ever makes a, runs two of your holes into each other and you can't read it anymore, you still have a backup. Um, you don't want to mix up somebody's hides. <clears throat> so once it's marked, then we salt it. Non-iodized white salt. Ours comes from um, American Stockman, I think. Uh, American Stockman has a real nice fine white salt. A lot of people use um, rock salt, granulated rock salt that's not too coarse. I, I'm not very fond of the coarse rock salt, but the fine rock salt, which I would guess is probably the approximate diameter of uh, maybe number four to six shot, five shot, somewhere in there. Um, that will work. A lot of people prefer that. So that you don't lose hair in your ears, don't forget to put a handful in each ear and work it back and forth. Rub the salt all over and, and put that cape on a slope so the juices run off of that cape and it doesn't sit in a whole lot of uh, slushy body fluids and salt water. Yes, ma'am. All right, we have a question from Jerry Morris, and he is wondering if you should salt first or right into the pickle, and what your recommendation is for that. People do both. I am a, I, I have my method, and I'm kind of um, not a know-it-all, but I'm adamant about how I do things because I've done everything wrong, and I've had a lot of errors along the way. So when I settled on something that worked and worked really well, I tend not to deviate from that. So if I tell you something and you do something different and it works for you, do what you do. Um, I like to salt first before it goes in a pickle because I feel that it, it removes all the fluids from the hide or a lot of the fluids from the hide and it sets the hair. Um, animals like fox have really um, sensitive ears and are susceptible to slippage. I have found if you salt those fox let them dry, you know, so they're, they're quite dry, like overnight or a couple days, um, we quit losing any hair in our ears. You know, the salt tends to set that hair. Also on deer faces, sometimes in the muzzle, if in, you people have ever been mounting a deer and you push some skin and, and all of a sudden you felt the skin slough off of the, the cheeks on each side of the cheek, um, it's because that hair was never set, that epidermis is not set. And by salting it ahead of time, even overnight will do. You don't have to salt it till it's hard. I don't like to salt it till it's hard. Um, we'll salt it overnight, usually put a fan in there. So it's getting firm. It's not, not juicy, full of body fluid anymore. Um, I think that's really important and I think the results are much better. Um, we know of a lot of people that take a whole animal, such as a bobcat, for instance, take the entire frozen bobcat and put it in a pickle and skin it out of the pickle. I've never done that. Um, there's a lot of well-known taxidermists um, that do award-winning work that treat their animals like that. So it's not my method, but a lot of people have success with that. So to make a long answer short, I like to salt them first before I put them in the pickle. Um, then, <clears throat> Once they go, the next day after I, I've salt them, let them sat there and drain, they're getting firm, but they're not too dry. Take that hide and put it in the pickle. You can look back um, last week's video, I think we, uh, or maybe a couple of day, weeks ago, we did, the vi we did the pickle, and it was a formic acid pickle. You can use citric acid, you can use oxalic acid. There's different acids that work. Um, remember, citric acid is a granular that you can, it's, it's safer to handle. Formic acid is liquid. Um, it's caustic right out of the bottle, so be very, very careful with it. Um, also, when you're buying, uh, like, formic acid, it comes in percentages. Um, make sure you get, like, a 90% formic acid. Otherwise, you're going to have to adjust the recipe till you can get a reading of 2.0 or lower on your, um, when you make a pickle. Make your pickle. The salted hide goes in it. We don't even shake off the salt. It's just going to combine with the salt in the pickle. And um, I think the recipe was online, and it's uh, um, 20 gallons of water, 20 pounds of salt, um, 13 ounces of formic acid, and a splash of um, X-Effect bactericide. And 
we put it in the pickle and that will draw all the fluids out of all the body fluids out of here. It'll clean up that hide a lot and it makes it able to be fleshed on the fleshing machine and it really makes it able to use your knife. Um, putting it uh, in the pickle, it's difficult to flesh a hide that's not pickled for me anyway. Then um, it's a matter of busy work and if you've never done this before, um, it'll be, it's kind of interesting, we're working with the students and they've um, struggled a little bit for a couple days until they got the hang of sharpening knives and um, motion with their knives and what to take off, how much to take off, how deep to flesh. Um, and it's kind of kind of fun to see because um, the, this day was a pretty successful day for them and they were able to skin and flesh really, really well their pickled hides and get them ready for tan. <clears throat> Once you fleshed your hide as good as it needs to be, practice will tell you um, you're going to want to, like I showed you before, thin your lips. These lips are what's going to be, no more work is going to be done on this hide um, really as far as fleshing once it comes out of the pickle and gets tanned. These lips are not going to get thinned any farther. They are thin. They're paper, paper, paper thin. The nostril tubes are very, very thin. You can, I can see my finger through the nostril tubes. Um, the eye, you're gonna, we, we like to use this membrane on the eye to tuck. Um, I may trim them up a little bit, but they're very, very thin, that apron, and I can see um, my finger through there. The one thing we did also, and I think we showed you, is we took um, the cartilage out of the ears. Those of you that wanna leave the cartilage in and do a Bondo ear method, um, you would still go through the whole process, but you're just gonna split your ears to the edges and leave the entire cartilage in. Our method of um, mounting a deer is we like to leave the inner ear canal in. That will get tucked down into our um, ear liner. And when you look at it from the inside, it's gonna be a very um, real and natural looking ear canal. We thin the edges. Um, we continually check, I can get this hide out where we can see it a little bit. Um, that hide should kind of start, people call it blue, I call it, it's kind of a gray blue, but it's getting really nice and thin and pliable. And when you're fleshed enough, it should be really stretchy. Now this cape um, is open all the way up. Typically when we skin a deer, when we cape a deer out, we make the short Y incision down the back. Um, some people will make a seven incision, just a short incision that you don't, so you don't have to sew up the whole neck. This one has been open um, all the way up. And when we get ready to mount this, we would probably sew that neck up and actually turn it into a short Y incision. Just makes it easier to mount. Um, this was one of, our, one of our capes. We buy a lot of capes throughout the year, and this was a cape where the hunter actually cut it all the way up to the neck, and we don't have a problem with that. We can work with that also. The one thing we didn't touch on is uh, make sure that you repair all of your holes, because right now in this pickled state is the best time to work on your cape. You can work on this cape for days, weeks, months, long, long time, and this cape is protected by that acid and by the pickle and by the salt. So um, we repair, do all of our repairs now because it's really safe to do repairs. You can spend all the time you want doing repairs. Once he's tanned, he's not in a safe state anymore. Um, once he's tanned, he's good for several days, but not as stable as he is when he's uh, um, in the pickled state. So now is a great time to pay, make repairs. And we haven't talked anything about repairs, and we'll save that for another, another segment. But uh, we have a wide assortment of needles. Most often on our leather, unless it's like an ear or a um, eyelid or anything like that, typically we're going to use a three-cornered cutting needle. And these come in, in two styles for me. Um, you may know way more about needles than I do, but... Um, we have surgical needles, which typically are stainless. 
and they have a stainless coating on them. Surgical needles, even though they're to sew up your gizzards and appendix and all other kind of things, um, even though they're surgical and they come from a medical supply facility, that coating leaves them a little not as sharp as I would like them. The surgical needles are slightly not as sharp. The Glover's needles, which look very similar, but they do not have a coating, they're like steel needles without a coating, are razor sharp, and if you catch your thread, slide your fingers over the edge of the needle, you can cut your fingers. That's how sharp these, this little triangular point on the needles are. Glover's needles are much sharper, the edges are much sharper than a surgical needle. <clears throat> Glover's needles do not withstand the pickles and they corrode and rust very fast. I love to use Glover's needles. They're just a breeze to sew any kind of leather, even thick leather. You can punch a Glover's needle through real easy without any effort, but um, a surgical needle, you're gonna struggle a little bit. Glover's needles are good for a few hours or a day and they're gonna be tarnished to where they, their edge is gone. All right, well, we have a birthday shout out to Vivian Aldrich, and she says it's the best entertainment she could ask for. <laughs> Vivian. And, and she is wondering, how do you properly split an ear? Um, splitting the ear is the easiest part. So when, if you look back at our video from last week, um, when we tape the deer out, we usually or often use ear splitters. We'll stick them up the back of the ear and it's like a reverse pliers. You open it up, you push the handle together and the jaws open up opposite of a pliers. And that will split the ear all the way to the edges. So splitting the ear to salt it is the easy part. Then it goes into the pickle and when it comes out, we want to split these ears to the very edges. And that's nothing more than feeling where the edge is, feeling how far you have to split, taking a sharp instrument like a scalpel or a knife and scoring it right along the seam and then just continue to feel where your edge is and if you're split as far as you need to be split. Some people like to leave the cartilage in and do a Bondo ear method. We prefer to take it out and use an ear liner to take it out, look, look back last week's uh, segment, and we usually will fold that ear in half, take a knife or a scalpel, score it across the surface of the cartilage, get a hold of a edge of it, and start working it this direction, and then two pieces, one towards the tip, one towards the base, and peel the ear cartilage out. Um, if you've never done it before, it's tedious, um, very frustrating until you get the hang of it. It's something that takes practice, practice, practice. Um, a lot of people aren't willing to put in the effort to learn how to do it, and I think that's why so many people don't use uh, ear liners is because it, it can be a learning curve, long learning curve. But look back, I think we, I think we gave a pretty good demonstration of that. Um, when it comes to threads, you can use anything. We used to use dental floss. We used to use uh, bow string. I think we showed you last week. Um, we have fire thread um, by the maker, by Berkeley, the makers of Fireline, formulated for the taxidermist. Um, we like fire thread a lot. That's all we ever use in the shop. Um, it's very thin. The, this is 20 pound, and 20 pound would be plenty thin enough to sew up the back of a deer without showing. You're never going to show. Um, it's thin enough that it's not going to leave like railroad tracks up the back of your deer. If I were sewing up a moose, I might want something much heavier, which I don't have. So I would take 20 pound and I would double it and sew with two strands, just one loop of string and just sew it up with that. And you've got a 40 pound. Um, ink is very fine and the eight is fine enough to do facial repairs. I think we probably even have a four that uh, you can do ears and lips, you know? And the nice thing about it when it dries, it's kind of a, 
a smoke gray color. It's, it's a great neutral color that doesn't show. Um, easy to hide, easy to color. So fire thread is our go-to. Um, we have spools and pools, spools of it. When it comes to needles, like I said, the surgical needles or the glover's needles either. Um, we use a lot of straights. Some of you might opt for the curved needles. There's a whole big assortment of needles and needles are inexpensive. So when you order needles, um, get several different kinds and several different sizes. Um, there's curved needles like this, like this one is a reverse curve, kind of like the little hull of a boat. Um, we have S needles. I like sewing up the back of my deer with S needles. We have big long needles, which I like sewing up fish with these big long needles because a slippery fish, I can hang on to these needles real well. So pick the area that you're going to repair. Look at how thick your hair is. For instance, if it were on the face, that's some pretty fine hair. That's some pretty thin skin. I don't want to be using something like this on a real small intricate area like that. Choose the needle, size of the needle, and the size of the line compared to the area that you're fixing. If it was down in this body, I have some pretty decent hair to hide things. Um, I could get away quite well with a big needle like that. Nobody's ever going to see it in here. Um, and I could, I'd probably go lighter, but I could use the 20 pound test and sew it up. Here's a, a hole that this deer had. Looks like a bullet hole that was in here. Um, sew it up. And once you do your repair, we just use a baseball stitch. Once you do re your repair, Take a hairbrush, brush it out, see how it looks. And if it looks good now, that's, that's about the best you can hope for. When you put it on the, on the mount, hopefully it vanishes. Um, the better you get it sewn, the better, better combinations of needle size and, and threads, um, the better your repairs are gonna be. So make all your repairs before um, we go into the tanning process because now is the time that you want to do that. All right, we have a few more questions coming in. Viv mm -hmm. Vivian is also wondering if the pickle is the pre-tan soak. Yeah, I guess you could call it a pre-tan pre -tan soak. Um, the pickle removes all the bloods and body fluids. It firms up the skin and it allows you to flesh it and it allows you um, time, you, you need time to work on it. And when it's in a pickled state, you have all the time in the world to work on it. So yes, and minimum times to have it in the pickle. If you put it in and leave it overnight, as you flesh, you're gonna notice it fleshes real well and you get to a really thick, thick, meaty area, you're gonna, it's gonna look like rare beef steak. The pickle has not reached that yet. So the pickle does take time to soak into these areas and it may take a day to two possibly three if you left thicker areas on there and um, try to get um, try to get them thin before they go into the pickle. But yeah, you could call it a pre-tan soak. All right, and then Matthew Mariva is wondering if a low pH in your pickle will give your hair the curls. It can. That's a very good question. Um, we try to maintain a 2.0 um, when we mix our pickle. When you put the hides in, um, it's probably going to raise. It'll probably, the next day you're going to come in and you're going to panic because it's at three. It's because that pickle, the acid is doing its job and going into that hide. If you leave, it's, it's interesting because if you leave the pickle untouched for a month, it will still test 2.0. But you put one small hide in a big pickle and it immediately within 24 hours will raise to um, probably three. Um, some people say you keep dumping acid in, keep dumping acid in. I used to do that years and years ago, and I now call it chasing the pickle. Don't, don't chase the pH. Um, 
if you mixed your pickle according to the recipe and it was 2.0, it's doing its job. You don't have to keep doing acid. You can do that for a month and you'll go through a gallon of, of acid. You don't need to do that. Um, 2.0 is good. I don't like leaving them in there for extended periods of time. Um, we do find that if we have too hot of a pickle, antelope have a real wispy hair on the end, and we have noticed that it can curl antelope hair. Um, and I'm sure it's not good and makes brittle any kind of hair. So, um, like I said, I left the Audad in there for seven years. That's not a good idea. The Audad's still in my showroom and looks really, really nice. But uh, that's not the thing to do. Um, but yes, it can. All right, then we've got Trophy Tines Taxidermy on YouTube, and they are wondering, besides a skive knife, what other tools do you use to thin around the eyes, nose, and lips? Um, one of my favorites is my Chicago Cutlery Knife. Um, this one's all full of Bondo, but um, Chicago Cutlery Knife, we use scalpels. Um, we have lots of bats. We have fleshing bats like this around the eyes. I really like to stick a bat like that once my eye is split. And I can, I can flesh both directions, up this direction, down that direction. Scalpels are fine. They work good. Sometimes, sometimes scalpels are so sharp that you can overflesh quicker than you were ready for. Um, we do a lot of trimming with our, our scissors like this. I like to do edges. Um, the West Snip scissors are, are great. I love to trim my edges with them, you know, those. But other than that, we have, uh, oh, let's see, little, um, you can keep the oh, here's what I was going to say. Super Skyver, we don't have one of those up here. We have several of these around the shop and they're nothing more than a two by four um, on a little one by four with a little two by four ramp. And uh, this is a great little homemade device. It's nothing more than a little flushing machine or flushing beam that we can put our hide on and we can actually, you know, flush like this. We would be lost. I wouldn't be able to, more so than the knives and everything else, I wouldn't be able to flesh anything without these. And practice, practice, practice. All right, and then we've got Eric Wickman on YouTube, and he is referring back to the fire, fed, fire thread, and he is wondering if you use the 20 pound fire thread, do you double the thread or just sew with one? Um, it kind of depends on the area that I'm sewing and how much pressure I'm going to put on the thread. So if I'm sewing an ear, for instance, I'm not going to be really cranking on that because the skin is so thin, I would cut through it. And I would like to use something really, really lightweight, so probably a four with maybe not one of the cutting needles, maybe a round needle like from Walmart, not one of the cutters. Um, I would sew it up and I would pull it just together, but I wouldn't crank on it really hard. Now in another area, um, say I have heavy skin, heavy hair, um, and it's gonna hide really well, maybe on an elk or something like that. 20 would be fine. If the skin is very thin and you're pulling hard, the 20 is thin enough, it could rip from side to side. Um, you can double it, double it. You can double any of these. So you're just going to have to try it. If Take a few stitches. If you think, wow, this is the best thing ever, um, keep going with it. If it's a little thin and wants to cut your skin, double it or go to a larger size. Um, also, whenever you repair anything on leather, leather is going to pull and stretch and draw away. Don't use any kind of a thread or material that's going to stretch. People like to use monofilaments because they're clear. You can sew up a whole deer with monofilaments, and I can't even tell where you did it until he dries. Once he dries, that leather is going to pull and pull and pull, and that monofilament is going to stretch and stretch and stretch. Anything with nylon or poly, uh, I think it's polyethylene or whatever it is, is going to stretch like crazy. Um, 
fire thread does has doesn't have any stretch. It's not going to stretch. It's great stuff. Okay, we're going to go on here for a second. Um, now, the next thing we want to do, this is still out of the pickle. This hide is still pretty acidic. Just to show you, I got water in the bucket here, and I'm going to put my litmus paper in it, my pH paper, and it is still at, it's slightly over a two, but it's at a, it's about a two and a half, so it's still pretty acidic, which means this hide is pretty acidic. Now, the problem with that is, some of you may have experienced this before and some of you may not have, um, a hide that has acid in it and goes into a dry state, it doesn't take very many years from now and that leather, will, that acid will start deteriorating that leather and it can rot. It's called acid rot. Um, we have had some hides here. We had a beaver a while back that it was hanging out in my showroom for two, three years. The beaver, I could take the edge of the leather, it was just a wall hanging, the edge of the leather and it pulled apart like, like wet tissue paper. Um, we had a bear back from one of the tanneries um, a few years ago and we got it out. Um, a customer had taken it home and then he wanted to sell this bear. So he brought it up and we had soaked it up and we got it out to measure it for a form and the ear just rotted all the way around. And we had prepped that bear, we had salted it, we sent it to the tannery. Um, and what that's from is the acid was not properly neutralized out of that hide and it continues to work on that hide and break down the fiber of that hide year after year after year after year. So we wanna make sure that that doesn't happen to any of our, our taxidermy work. So we're gonna neutralize this hide. That's the first part in our tanning process is we have to neutralize this hide. So I checked the water in there. The water's pretty acidic. So our method of neutralizing, we think it's so important that um, we even put it in our Matusica taxidermy supply catalog that all of you have by now, correct? Um, and there's a whole page, 123, a big advertisement on how to neutralize for those of you that want it in a printed form. So I will do that. <clears throat> My neutralizing, I probably over, overdo it, overthink it, um, but it's gonna be three stages. I wanna rinse that hide and to rinse it, I have, these buckets are about three gallons worth. We usually do it in the sink, but so I can be in front of the camera, um, I've just got three gallons of water. In that water, I want a handful of salt. And we mentioned it last week, another symptom that can happen with your hides is you can get acid swelling. Acid swelling is when this hide swells up. You flushed it really, really thin. It's beautiful, beautiful, stretchy condition, perfect for tanning. Um, all of a sudden you put it in one of the baths and it seems funny, it seems to thicken up, um, seems to get very stiff, it gets kind of a gelatin-y look to it. That's called acid swelling. Acid swelling can be eliminated, you don't have to worry about it, if you put a little salt in every bath that you do. We do not put any kind of a hide in any kind of a soak without salt. Um, whether it's a rinse, whether it's a bactericide, um, whether it's a degreaser, a little salt goes in every one of our baths. So what I have here is three gallons of water. Um, I'd usually just put it in the sink. Nothing's critical. We don't measure the salt. I'm gonna put a handful of salt. It's not anything that's gonna show up on the hide. We're gonna shampoo that hide before we mount it anyway. I put a little salt in there and just for safety, um, we love our bacteria side. I call it liquid insurance. Back X effect, it's non-phenolic. You don't have to worry about getting anything absorbed into your skin. It's a hospital disinfectant and everybody knows, everybody goes to the hospital is healthy. I put it in the water like that, the rinse, 
this is not a long rinse. It's going to be nothing more than, now I would normally do this in the sink so I can do it more like laundry. Okay, and while that's buckets um, sitting there and he's kind of soaking and, and rinsing, I'll take another bucket and I'll fill it up with water, and that's going to be my neutralized. And if you don't catch this all while I'm talking, uh, page 123 of the catalog, and it doesn't matter what kind of tanning chemical you're using or um, you know, what manufacturer or whether you're using a immersion tan or application tan, uh, the process is all the same uh, for neutralizing. Neutralizing for me is neutralizing. Here I'm going to put in a handful of salt again, nothing but plain water in here. Make sure your salt gets dissolved. If I had to give you um, how much uh, X effect in here, I'd probably say heaping teaspoon, a teaspoon's fine. It's very strong, very pleasant odor, um, nothing medicine-y or nothing commercial smelling. And then, baking soda is what we neutralize with. Baking soda, we, you can get it in the grocery store or we have it in, um, I don't know, I think 5, 10, 20 pound containers, and I'm going to put in one ounce for every gallon of water. So, and it's, it's not very critical. I have a, I have a seven ounce cup, so I'm going to guesstimate about half of that's about almost three ounces. Where did you go to school? Half of seven is three. Um, Nothing in here is harmful. Water, salt, baking soda. Now I will take my hide out of the rinse. I'm going to put it in the tub to start with. That was rinse number one. My rinses, rinses come out pretty dirty. Um, this cape has never been, never been washed yet, and I save, if I'm going to wash a cape, I will save all my washing before um, I mount him. Okay, make sure your baking soda is all mixed up. Water temperature should be nice, comfortable, um, room temp to cool, never warm, never cold. I will drain this a little bit and then stick it right into the neutralizing and then just plunge it up and down. Make sure that that baking soda gets all over that hide. Now because I'm doing that on this table in front of the camera and trying to be real neat, um, I'm not making it look like I'm getting the baking soda everywhere. I would put it in the sink and I would plunge it up and down, up and down just like you were doing laundry. Make sure that all areas get, all pockets of acid are going to get that baking soda water. Now, if you want to see what that does, let's take Let's take a little uh, pH paper, take that pH paper, put it on that hide, and look what happened. That's very, very basic, and that is rendering all acid in this hide harmless, back to neutral, and that hide um, is not going to rot on you down the road. Yes. All right, we have two questions from Amy Roeder and Craig Robertson, and they are both wondering the shampooing, um, when you would do the shampooing on a cake. We like to shampoo them just before we mount them. 
And I'll explain that process um, in depth just a little bit later. But um, my big thing now is to get them tanned because I'm going to put an application tanning oil on here. We're going to use Trubon, Trubon 1000. And um, I'm going to put the Trubon on. Trubon's going to get in the hair. So if I went through a whole big washing step right now, um, I'm going to have, I'm going to have uh, oils, tanning oils into the hair, and I'd have to do it again. The one exception where I will wash ahead of time is if I'm going to de degrease something like a raccoon or a bear. Um, I would probably do a degrease degrease solution, and there's Liposol 77, Liposol 55. There's some great degreasers on the market. Um, True Bond has a couple, um, and uh, I think Pro One probably has a great tanning chemicals as well as degreasers. So we want to make sure you degrease those so that if a real oily bear goes into one of the soaks, I'm not sure that the soak is going to get where it needs to get through the oils. Uh, but for mounting purposes for a deer, I'm going to wash it just before I mount him. And then Vivian Aldrich is wondering how long you would pickle a bear. Oh, a bear is not necessarily an overly thick animal, and I do it on the thickness of the skin. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pickle a bear overnight. I'll probably get him out the next day. I will start fleshing. As I'm fleshing, I'm going to notice there's places that did not get the pickle yet. You can still go right on fleshing. Um, when I'm done for the day or for that session, he goes back in the pickle, continues to pickle. Um, it's going to take, to get the thick areas around the head and the neck, it's going to take maybe two to three days before he's pickled through and through. I'm going to say two to three days. And it depends how good you flesh. If you flesh him really, really good, faster. Okay, now we put him in the, in the neutralizing bath, and I want him in there by thickness is going to determine how long he's going to be in there. I always say a deer, 30 minutes. So this deer is going to be in here for 30 minutes. Baking soda is non-critical. You can leave him in an hour. You're not going to lose any hair or anything. It's going to be great. Um, you can do him 15 minutes. He's probably still going to be neutralized very well. So... Um, 15 minutes to 30, I usually shoot for 30. While the, while the hide is in here, at that point, I will mix up one more rinse. And again, I do this in the sink. And I'm going to take a little salt. Same exact rinse as the first bath. And this one is to rinse out my baking soda. Sodium bicarbonate, make sure that you don't get mixed up because we also carry sodium carbonate, which is a completely different animal. Now just for time purposes, we're going to assume we did the 30 minutes here. And I'm going to take him out into here. And now, we had a rinse, a neutralize, and now back into, this one's going to overflow, I can tell. Back into another rinse. Just to be safe. Okay, and I would, like I keep saying, I would do this in the sink and plunge them up and down just like you do, just like you do laundry. Have a leaky bucket. Dump that. And all I'm doing with this one is I'm, I'm rinsing out my baking soda. Yeah, please. And now I need to drain this. I need to drain this hide. I would leave it in here. My rinses are only going to be three to five minutes just to get rid of that baking soda. The first rinse was just to loosen up all the dirt. Look how white he's turning. Is he not looking pretty? 
Okay, that was the neutralize. Now remember, you're not gonna have three buckets and all that kind of stuff. It'll be much easier, you'll have a system. Um, okay, if you guys have something to tell them about, I'm gonna take him over. We have a, I wanna drain him before we can tan him. I wanna drain him real well. So I'm going to take him over. You can hang him by the back of the head if you want to or over some kind of board and let him drain for probably a few hours. Or we have a wash machine on spin that we picked up at drunk, <laughs> drunk days. Uh, <laughs> we got really drunk with, no, junk days. And um, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work, but the spinner works. So it just spins this out. I like that we even use it on birds. We put um, this hide in here and I'm going to put, uh, if it was a tube skin, I'd put the hair out, spin him a cycle. Um, I would flip him right side out or inside out and then I would spin him another cycle and when you come out, you save yourself a whole lot of hanging around and draining. So I'm just gonna put him in the wash machine if you guys can keep the audience occupied for a couple minutes. For We're ready for that, oh yeah, sorry. Some of you that have been waiting for orders or maybe we're behind or the phone lines. I know Jay, you were asking about the phone lines. The phone lines were down on Monday, which is a terrible day to be down. But they're back up and working. Um, they are still really busy. So if you get the busy signal, it's just because all the lines are full. Um, we got Pro One back in. We got the Pro One chemicals back in. We were out of those for a while. We're still out of stock of driftwood, but we have some awesome artificial driftwood that you can take advantage of. Um, we just got done running our sale, our Valentine's sale for um, some great savings. So that is, well, it's done now. If you missed it, I'm <laughs> sure Kate will have a nice little Valentine's Day, which is Sunday for those of you um, that forgot. Make sure you get your speedy something. Um, what else? Tell them about Tell them what they're gonna win while, oh, the so they can be anticipate, because this, this is, is a new product and it is, um, this new product Still we got, okay? it's online yeah. only, a lot of our new stuff that you'll we'll see us talk about is online because the catalog's already coming out. But this Keep is going. a knife set. I have a feeling this one's gonna stay back here, but these are heavy duty knives and it's called the Hunter's Kit. I don't know if you can see that, but you got, Four very nice and they look very sharp, sharp mundial knives. And, and the best thing of the steel. whole deal is, is you laid that nice wrapper in the water so we can't sell it. So you I get it. it. I get it. I know. We're going to sell <laughs> the new one. So that is a giveaway. So make sure to like and share the videos for your chance of giveaways. Yes, this is all yours. I'll take it out for you to buy. Um, what else, Kate? What else is back in stock that's been out? Jay said he was ordering counterfeit skulls. Those did. We just got a huge shipment of those. So those are back in. Hand pastels, all the colors are in. We've been busy. It's been fun, but it's busy. I'm ready for those junk days he was talking about. What do you want? Did you have any questions? We do have a couple. I'm going to stand by in case you can hear me. Oh. Um, so we have Witty from YouTube who has a case in their freezer that was tanned and never oiled and has been washed. Should they just oil it up or will it need a tan treatment again? I wonder how it was tanned. I don't think you're, I don't, I don't know the process entirely, but if it was tanned at one time, I'm gonna say it should be good. And if it should just need the oil, I'm gonna say. One of the things people are asking about is shows. I know a lot of the shows that we go to have canceled. Some are doing virtual. We currently are not doing any shows. Nationals and the World Show this summer are on our list, and we are planning on those. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. Um, this whole COVID thing is not going away as fast as it's supposed to. I know, to. but I'm going to be very honest. It's very. I miss all my taxidermy family from the show. Don't get me wrong. But it is really nice not packing up all our stuff and going. There's no way we could do it right now. So 
that part is nice, but I do miss everybody. But hopefully world show and nationals. We have right now so you can go vote for your favorite selfie um we're doing a first place winner and a second place so what's the first place winner kate i don't even remember so the two photos that have the most likes on facebook from the public will each get two pls and a card and then we as a staff will vote on our favorite and they will get a hundred dollars so technically if the our staff votes for one of the same ones that would you have a chance to win 150 dollars correct of Matuska box, okay? I like it. So make sure that you guys put your selfie pictures up for your chance to win that. Are you almost done? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, our pack mounts are back in stock. Those have been going like crazy. Oh my so gosh. Those. We'll get another delivery tomorrow. Our little pack mount factory making. Mm-hmm. Okay, I... um took this hide out of the washing machine on spin, and I just had some towels there, so I just wrapped it up, and I'm gonna let it absorb juice while I look at these neat Mundell knives really quick. Ooh, that's a great sharp knife for boning out deer. Um, probably not the best for skinning, but man, for cutting things, it's exceptional. Um, this paring knife, um, we have little white ones like Dexter ones. It's a little bit like our Dexter white ones, mm -hmm. which everybody loves. Um, that's a nice little detail knife. Um, Trey's just mentioned that the Georgia show is next month. So for those of you in that area, hit up the Georgia show. So that is on if you're looking to compete and get to a show. Boy, they're sharp right out of the container. Um, we always see how sharp our knives are by, I'm not a very hairy guy, do but uh, we always see about shaving on the back of my hand is my most hair. Um, very nice, very nice. Do you prefer oil wash for deer capes? Oil wash, no, I, for cleaning them, I'm thinking he's thinking, um, we use um, our shampoo soap, our hide shampoo. And there's a lot of different, um, um, I think Tubon has a shampoo, um, Pro One probably has a shampoo, most of the companies have a, some kind of a wash. Um, we, use, we use our shampoo, our first shampoo that we like. Okay, your hide should look Semi-dry, should look real nice. It should almost look, almost look like a wet tan hide. I did use your brush too. Do you have these? A very similar one. That you can brush quick release, and yeah. you get hair in it and then you push the button. I carry a little bit bigger ones, yes. Um, this one's kind of nice. Um, check them over really good because you don't, I mean, you should have repaired everything by now. Okay. Here's another thing. Okay, I'm going to give you options. Not a right or a wrong. You're going you're gonna to do it one way or the way somebody tells you and maybe experiment and, and decide on your own method. <clears throat> Once he's spun out like this, um, you can go different directions. The tanning method that we're going to use is True Bond 1000. Truebond 1000 is a, is a really good um, application tan. It's a rub-on tan. You're going to warm this up. We will warm it up in a container like this in the microwave till it's nice and toasty, not boiling. Um, put on a rubber glove, massage it into this entire deer cape, and it's going to penetrate that, and it's actually a tanning oil. And... Um, it's similar to Liquitan, another good product. Um, Pro One has an application um, rub-on like this. They're all similar in the way they're used. And I'm going to massage it in. At that point, um, if you could handle the slipperiness, you could mount that deer right away. 
Um, they're pretty difficult to sew them up. They're pretty difficult to get on a form. You can't use hide paste with an oily skin. So what a lot of people will do is once the oil's applied, they will fold them up skin to skin, roll them up, set that skin aside, and um, let that oil penetrate for a few hours, I'd say two to three hours. Put him in a plastic bag, put him in the freezer, order your form. Now is a good time to measure him, by the way. Um, once he comes out of that um, wash machine and he's spun out and he's nice to work with, um, is an excellent time to measure that skin because he will never be bigger than he is right now and he'll always go back to that size. So always check your measurements now. Yeah. Will shampooing a tan deer hide help with neutralization? Oh, I think it does, yes. Um, I do know people that don't neutralize their hides and get by very, very, very fine. I know a very famous white-tailed taxidermist that neutralizes nothing, and when we talk about it, he said, why neutralize? You know, I wash them before I mount them, so I think, I think this is my method, I'm not gonna change, but I don't think it's, I may be overkill. Um, so you can put that in a bag, order your form, get it all set up, take this out of the freezer, let it thaw overnight, and it will not have all that oily, oily residue like before, and you can mount them. The method that we found that we have tanned hides for 40 years, and um, in our early tanning history, we had occasional slippage, occasionally more than we like to see, and, uh, and uh, we found that, I think it was an old Joe Combs recipe, where he recommended, he was using Liquitan, he said once you Liquitan that hide, dry the hide, stretch it and dry it. Rehydrate it when you're ready to mount it. And we started doing that and have never changed. It's an exceptional way. Um, you eliminate your hair slip, almost always, I'll say that. Um, Okay, quickly here, I'm gonna lay this hide out and I'm gonna put on um, Trubon 1000. I like to drain this hide a little bit. I'll take salt uh, and I'm not putting it on like I did when we took him off the animal. I put a little bit of salt on him. I will take this hide now and I will hang it over um, we got two by twos in our tannery. I'll hang it over the two by twos and let it s leach any moisture out of this hide. What kind of salt are you using? Can you um, can get it from the grocery store? Yeah, you can get it from the grocery store. Non-iodized white salt. Getting it from the grocery store is more expensive, but yes, you can. Um, buying it in the little, you know, two pound containers, that's not the way to get it. What's get it from, I think ours is American Stockman. American Stockman. I'm going to quickly oil this and show you what I do. Um, and it's non iodized white livestock salt. Now, we had a whole shipment of it in a while back, and it was a dirty, dirty gray, and people didn't like it, but we used it, and it works great. We've had it before where um, for some reason it comes out from the company Gray. I'm gonna put this, okay, Trubon 1000, I'm gonna put it in the microwave for 15 seconds. The microwave. Microwave and warm it up. My deer does not like okay, I'll do it. cold oil. You wanna do it? 15 seconds. What's the difference between 1000 and 1000 E? I'll tell you when you come back. 15 seconds. 20. Yes? All right, how long do you dry hide before rehydrating? Um, the old articles on how to do that, and I, I haven't seen anybody drying hides for a long time, um, but again, like I said, it works so exceptionally well for us. We get a great stretch, we get great um, hair holding, tan, and uh, somebody once said it takes five days for that oil to form a chemical bond with this skin. Um, this skin in the wintertime now will dry pretty hard overnight. Um, in, the, in the summertime where it's real humid, it's gonna take all five days. So I think it depends on, on uh, the time of the year. And we do put fans on it too, but um, 
just till it's nice and dry, and I'm going to show you one here in a second. How'd you do? <laughs> Does this say it on the directions to heat it up, or is that just a... Somebody must. Okay, and I'm just going to put it in here. Now, I'm getting it in the hair. I'm not worried about that because I'm going to rinse it out. I do not like to get it on my ears. Um, I'm laying it on the ears, and some's going to get on there for sure. But drumming and ears go hand in hand, and we try everything possible not to let our ears drum when we, when we glue the ear liners in. Um, I think by keeping the oil to a minimum on your ears, um, they stick better. And I do have a piece of litmus paper I'm pushing all over the side. Now, um, Trubon 1000, Liquitan, the different companies that have the rub-on tans. Um, in the years previous, I have done some pretty large animals. I've done a life-size um, caribou with this method. I've done a life-size doll sheep with this method. And I've done a life-size competition mountain lion with this method. Um, all three of those large animals worked. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, any of these topical applications like this that's not a immersion tan, any of those, you're limited on how long you have to work with this hide. And that might scare some of you, but I would say you're going to have for sure, if this cape is a healthy cape and came from an animal, um, for sure you're going to have three, possibly four working days with this cape. No taxidermist needs four days with working on a white-tailed deer. Um, after you're an accomplished taxidermist, um, you're going to mount one deer a day to maybe even possibly two deer a day, and people do more than that even. Um, so. Once the oil's on, I like to let him sit like this for a little bit, and then um, I stretch him between boards. And I'm gonna grab one that's been stretched, and I'll show you how we do that. Almost done. Just keep right on going. Okay, now if this if this cape was tubed, we have sticks like this. I suppose they're little one by twos with a bolt through the top. We stick it all the way up into the nose, and we'll actually put a staple in the fur and in the leather, stretch him open and we hang them in our tannery with a fan and they'll dry. Once they're dry, this one's only been in overnight. Once they're dry, they start looking like this. See how nice and white that is? And it's, it's not soft, supple by any means, but it is somewhat pliable. This hide, when we get ready to mount it, we're gonna take this hide off these stretching boards. We're going to rehydrate it, water, handful of salt, um, X effect, bactericide. This will soak up, if it's fleshed well, this will soak up very, very easy and very fast. Once it's soaked up, I'd leave it in the water for maybe an hour to two, take it out of the water, drain it, roll it up, put it in a plastic bag. Next day, get your mannequin ready. Um, get your antler set, get your ears on, get your eyes set. Take this out, let it come to room temperature, and it is going to be one of the nicest mounting capes you're going to have. There, it's, going to be except, it's going to have exceptional stretch. Um, you repair it, everything. Everything's thinned. You're going to glue in your ear liners um, or do your Bondo ears, whichever method you do. And uh, that's kind of our method of how we treat a hide if we were to tan it in-house. And it's going to be very similar to a, to a tan hide.
from the commercial tannery. Any questions left over? Yes, we have a couple questions. Um, What is the beneficial difference of wet and dry tan? Um, a dry tan, there never used to be wet tans to start with. Um, and in the olden days, you get a dry tan and you could store them for a limited amount of time. They come in a box and they're dry, just like a nice piece of leather with the hair on. And when you wanted to mount them, you would soak them up or order forms. You'd soak them up, water, a little bactericide, salt, just like we do here and we would um, lay them out, stretch them, measure them for forms, order forms, and freeze them until the forms came. That's a dry tan. They have to be rehydrated. The wet tans are a hide like this. Let the oils permeate that leather. It will go into a tumbler, a lot of times with hardwood sawdust or tumbling media of some sort. They will tumble them until they're nice and dry but still very damp damp enough to sand. They'll put them in a box, plastic line box, fold them all up, and we have a whole lot of African coming, coming from the tannery, and the box is gonna be like a 50 pound box, it'll probably be a couple of them, and you'll pull them out, and the hides will be very moist. You don't have to go through a huge rehydration bath. We found that taking wet tans and rehydrating them in water, though, will give you more stretch. But a wet tan comes wet, and then you're gonna to have to freeze them to store them. A dry tan comes dry and you can soak them up as you need to mount them. All right, and then Goodell is wondering, during rehydration, what is added to water? Um, I always, always put in salt, no matter what. Um, if anybody tells me different, I still put in salt. I, I've had acid swelling, you won't like it. Um, I love, my bactericide, I call it, like I said before, liquid insurance, I'll always put in a splash of bactericide. Some people, um, your, your tannery may have their own recipe that they give you, and if you wanna follow what they give you, that they know what works best to rehydrate their hides. Another thing that helps is a couple drops of soap, and I don't mean a big old squirt of Dawn, but just two to three drops of soap in a sink full of water actually thins the water. We always say it makes water wetter. It thins the water and it permeates the leather quicker. All right, and then the last question from YouTube comes from James and he is wondering if it will absorb only so much. Water? Probably. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> That's all um, I have. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's gonna only absorb so much. Even uh, if it were a dry tan, it's only gonna absorb so much, I think. Um, you will wanna, if, if it were a dry tan and you put it in a rehydration and let it soak, it's gonna be like a sponge. You're gonna take it out and drain it before you even measure it and things like that. Our dry tans, we have a bunch of pegs out of the wall in our tannery and our dry tans, when we rehydrate them, we'll hang them up by the back of the head, let them drip until we can handle them without them running all over the place. It'll drip back into the sink. Um, yeah, they'll only absorb so much and then you're gonna drain them before you work with them. All right, we had two quick questions come in. Um, Jeremy is wondering what the best way to rehydrate an African cape is. Um, an African cape, I'm gonna bet he's talking about from Africa, like fresh from Africa. That's hard, that's really, really hard. Um, there's water is, and this sounds dumb, water's the best thing to rehydrate your African skin with, but nothing protects it when it's in water. I would put in a bactericide, since bacteria growth is what causes slippage. I would put in a little bactericide in my water, and salt is always a safety measure. Um, by putting salt in, it's gonna rehydrate slower, but it's gonna be safer. Um, I would put in salt. I would, I, we don't rehydrate any African skins just because I'm not patient enough and I'm scared I'm gonna lose them. Um, I would lean if it's flint dried like an African skin and salted and hard, I'd send it to the tannery um, or, or talk to somebody who does that regularly. Um, Brad Colson gave me a, a great rehydration recipe one time and I think you put those hides in there for as many as two to three days and I'd be a nervous wreck by that time. I can't handle it, so send them to the tannery and uh, I'm, not, I'm not the right person for that answer. 
All right, the last question, is Dawn okay to use as a degreaser? We use it, we use a lot. Um, I did a lot of testing with Dawn. There used to be a, a degreaser years and years ago and they said it's the best degreaser ever and so I had all these test tubes set up. Don't, if you're trying to sell me something, I probably won't take it at face value unless I know you and really, really trust you. I'm gonna test it myself. And I had all these test tubes set up and I had one with this Miracle product and I had one with plain water and I had one with Dawn and water and I took a toothpick and I put axle grease on it, toothpick, and I dropped it down in the magic stuff and it did nothing. It didn't fizz, it didn't eat it off the toothpick or anything. I did the same thing with the Dawn and the Dawn actually it wasn't instant and it was very slow, but it was doing something. So then I thought, well, maybe a bearing grease is what it was. Wasn't a fair, fair test, so I tried butter. I did butter in this magical elixir that somebody tried to sell me, and the butter just sat there for an hour, never did anything. So I put butter in the Dawn, and the Dawn immediately dissolved the butter. So Dawn is what I'm going to go to before this magical stuff. Um, so don't be afraid to test things and I have done a little experimenting with Dawn and we use it on birds, we use it on fish, we use it on um, hides, we like Dawn. All right, well that sums up all of our questions so now it is time our to giveaway. announce our Hunter Series Kit giveaway. This is a good outfit. Yeah. And what do these sell for? That it's, it, it's a pretty expensive it's, kit. It sells for $81.95. So we're giving it away? We are giving it away. And what's the away. sale price on it? Isn't that like $40? It was, I believe, fifty thirty nine 39 around that. So it was a pretty good sale price. Um, but, yeah. And that giveaway goes to Kyle Fisher. Oh, Kyle, you're going to love it. All Don't right. end up in emergency. Um, congratulations, you're going to like it. Mundial is good stuff. All right. That's a nice set. That's a great giveaway. I wanted to win it. I get this one, I guess, because Mandy got the, <laughs> got the thing all wet. Okay, thanks a lot for joining us. Um, hope, hope we enlightened you a little bit on, on uh, canning. And this is something, if you've never done it before, don't start on your customer's capes. Get a deer, either buy a raw deer cape or a deer that maybe you shot yourself and attempt this. The whole secret I always say to tanning hide more than anything else is flushing, proper thinning. A properly thinned hide, I don't want to say is guaranteed to come out great, but your results are going to be much better with a properly thinned hide. Um, practice with something, mount a deer, see what you think. It's not as hard as it looks. Not as hard as I made it look. <laughs>